Iowa's News Now Sports brings you black and gold glory. Your all-access pass to all things Hawkeyes. This is Eye on the Hawks. A red-letter day for black and gold, so to speak. Mitch Fick here with Owen Sebring. This is Eye on the Hawks, and I wore green, of course, because just had to throw everything out of the out of the way to match the red skin. We are fully, <laughs> fully toasted from uh, from Kids Day at Kinnick on Saturday. Lots to break down from that. But this is Eye on the Hawks. This is a way that we feel like we can really expand sports coverage that we can do more so than on a day-to-day basis. The sports cast that we get to do are maybe like two and a half, three minutes. We, you, getting to do, do them. We don't get a ton of time. This is a place where all those cool little storylines, little asides that we get from, from press availability or just highlights, and the stuff that we can shoot, and really – serve them up and really admire them for what they are and, and just to do a little more analysis and a better look at, at Hawkeye football. Yeah, the University of Iowa really gives us great access yeah. to the players and the coaches and every single week, every Tuesday throughout the regular season, we get access to, you know, a ton of players. And so, you know, we're just very limited on what we can do, even with our half hour show on uh, that we aired during the week with Eye on the Hawks. Um, even with that, there's still a ton of extra stuff that we can have. And so um, a podcast brings us a good opportunity to bring some more of those stories that might not make the air. Yeah, and obviously this is a podcast, audio, but we are going to be putting these on YouTube, and that's where we're going to be sharing a lot more highlights. You're going to be, be watching those sound bites too. So, um, And we'll start streaming those live once we get into the season. Sunday podcast will be live on YouTube. You can interact with that in the chat, and we'll try to have a good back-and-forth dialogue. Thank you to everybody who's already – Subscribed on uh, the podcast platform of your choice. The Twitter page has, I think we're pushing like 20 followers, and I don't know all of them, mm-hmm. so that's nice, getting strangers already into that. So to thank everybody. Um, and the big thanks we have to throw out before we really get into the, the rundown of this opening pod is Mike Howell. He's the executive producer of this. This was his idea, so if it goes off the rails, blame Mike. There's his Twitter handle. Uh, throw, some, throw some shade his way. But, uh, Mike, just talk about it a little bit. I don't even know if we've talked about this of just – why, why in the world you would drag us into something like this? <laughs> yeah, it all started, I was in this leadership for our company, this leadership class, and we have a sister station in Columbus, and the guy was like, we're going to start a, a Buckeye podcast, and I was just thinking, you know, we have the resources, we cover the Hawkeyes already, we already have a show that airs on Thursdays during the season, what a better way to, to kind of just go behind the scenes and then actually get me to, to cover some games finally, <laughs> 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 just to start a podcast, and so that's basically the idea that, yeah. you know. I know Mike and I had talked about podcast stuff before just because with the nature of my work, I get a chance to do a lot of really interesting interviews, especially with some of my Where Are They Now stories, you know, with guys like Merton Hanks and Jess Settles especially are just such, you know, they're 40-minute interviews that we have to compress into a three- to four-minute package, and so there's a lot of good stuff there that I'm like, gosh, I wish that more people could listen in on these conversations. And so I was like, boy, that'd be an interesting thing to put in podcast form. It's kind of turned into that's a good YouTube page content, but um, just the idea of a podcast, I think, for – you know, us television people to branch to podcasts. I think uh, it's a nice, easy transition with with the kind of work that we do. Yeah, it's mid twenty twenty three. Probably about time we do something <laughs> like that. But you, you I, I'm always so apologetic to people when I go out on interviews. Okay, we're gonna have a, a, a great conversation for 25, 30 minutes. I'm gonna use forty seconds of yeah. it because that's all I can afford to use in it. Um, so yeah, this is just a great opportunity to expand. So, again, thanks to Mike. Mike is graphic stuff everything like this there's the twitter page to go in uh, shameless plug yeah, yeah there you go Hawks, might as well what, 21 us. is that 21 followers 21 followers holy yeah, cow folks so um yeah so thanks to everybody who's already following and again mike mike has put the the bones of this together and has really done a tremendous job so now that the ple- pleasantries are out of the way let's get to cade shall we uh again we're going to be showing uh, some video of stuff from kids day and and uh, so if you're just listening uh the youtube channel will be the way to Look at this stuff. But let's take a look at the crumble heard around Kinnick on Saturday, about halfway through Kids Day. Cade McNamara, who was looking great. We'll get into the, the offense and what it was doing before. This here, just a little stumble, goes down, and everyone held their collective breath all of a sudden. And uh, I think Scott Docterman with The Athletic uh, wrote a great write-up, said the, the sigh of relief may have been a mini derecho, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> but you see there, he came back out, no pads on, uh, didn't have anything on his lower legs, though. And you see sharing some smiles with, with Joe Evans and Cooper DeGene there. Kirk gave him a little pat on the back. But let's hear from, uh, from Kirk right after the practice, right after that meeting there, about 15, 20 seconds after. Hey, what's the, what's the word there? 
Uh, it sounds like it's a muscle muscle issue. So, you know, it's unfortunate, obviously. Uh, you know, he needs work like everybody out here needs work, but hopefully nothing too serious. One of those things I'm sure he wants to test it out. I'm sure you guys want to see it too. But I, it, Yeah, not, not today. Get, yeah. yeah, not today, certainly. So, um, you know, you look at him inside and, you know, see where Howard spawns here. But, you know, fortunately, it's just muscle. So, yeah, no, so no knees since that was the... No, 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 as far as I know, no. Up above this, so... Did your heart stop a little bit? I mean, that's... Anytime anybody's good. down, that's not good. Yeah. You know, we had one over on the sideline, too. I think he's fine. Tanner's fine. But uh, anytime anybody goes down, that's that's the worst part of football. I think one of the <laughs> unfortunate parts, especially about it, if you're if you're Kirk and just like the, the staff, I mean, obviously we all hope that Kate is okay, but that, the fact that this had to happen in front of, you know, 6,000-plus fans and all the media cameras there, I'm sure they're like, oh, gosh, why today? Because something like this you know, with a lot of players probably happens in practice on a somewhat regular basis and they go and they get checked out and they're cleared and you never hear a word about it. But, you know, for their starting quarterback, the guy who has all the headlines coming into this year, it's like, boy, not not great timing <laughs> for that to happen. This reminds me of something uh, slightly similar that happened. I'm going to look up the actual. I believe it was it might have been Kids Day 2012. Mm -hmm. Let me look it up. Barkley Hill, who was a stud at Cedar Falls. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it was Kids Day 20. It was I was probably two weeks before I, I left KGA and the first time I moved away, Saturday, August 18th. Uh, yeah, I was running into the, the end zone. I should have sent this to you, Mike, but it's kind of <laughs> not related anymore. But uh, if you search Barkley Hill, uh, it'll pop up. But yeah, he went into the end zone uh, on a on a scrimmage play and, and did his knee again. And boy, Barkley Hill uh, kind of went through the ringer. He had a knee at Cedar Falls his senior year and all that. But yeah, yeah you're used to that happening in practice and you hear about it. It's, you know, you heard Kirk say there when I asked him, like, you, you want him to probably see how, what he can do on that knee. You guys want to see. This is not the stage or the moment for that. But again, knocking on all the wood you can, uh, it feels like, yeah, maybe just a, some sort of leg muscle type thing that he shouldn't miss a whole lot of time with. Yeah, that's, that's how Kirk made it sound. And I mean, I, I did, I don't know if I'd even say I was concerned because Kirk made it sound like, yeah, we, we hope and we plan on this not being a huge sure. deal. But afterwards, as, as the media was chatting with him, I went over and I took a little video with my cell phone of him getting on the cart on the gator and kind of elevating his leg as he was carted off. And so, I mean, I still do have, you know, maybe a, li a little bit of concern there, just that everything's going to be all right. But um, uh, by and large, you know, this is, this is our guy that we're kind of planning on watching this season and seeing under center, seeing what he can do in a Hawkeye uniform. And um, you just start thinking like, Gosh, we really hope that that doesn't all <laughs> go up in smoke before sure. he even gets a chance to get started. The fact that he was A, out there, I think the fact that he came back out and there was nothing on his legs, I, I think if it would have been really bad, I don't know if he comes back yeah. to the tunnel to be out there. Sure. And the fact that morale did uh, appear to be pretty high, that yeah. at least is some sort of comfort. And I, I think that we were going to you know, talk about De uh, Deacon Hill a little mm -hmm. bit, his guy who came in after him, um, just that you know he – He's got a lot of potential, too. I mean, yeah. it, the, the parallels between him and Kate are strange, even though they're different styles of quarterback, both guys who transfer to Iowa in the offseason from Big Ten schools. Deacon's coming over here from Michigan. Um, Wisconsin. Uh, sorry, yes, Deacon coming here from Wisconsin. Um, I mean, he, as, as new as he is to the system as well, he looked all right out there for quarterback. Eventually, yeah. yeah. So let's uh, – we've got – again, if you're going to watch on YouTube, we've got kind of a – two minute plus kind of chronological breakdown of what we saw in the scrimmage. Uh, we did see some good stuff before before Cade went down. That offense had some really nice moments. So Mike's going to fire up that video here. Uh, this starts, he had the little sidearm here. I love this. Yep. Out to Seth Anderson, who we'll talk more about in a little bit. But nice little rundown. Uh, boy, Seth, yeah, looking like Flipper's son more and more there for sure. And you had Caleb Johnson. Uh, not a ton of stuff from the running backs today, but that's probably one of Caleb's better runs of the day and then i believe this might be uh this might be jamari harris no this is caleb brown we'll get into caleb brown a little bit too i think that was his one big catch in traffic harris was in in coverage there and then i believe uh jamari might have got his revenge on this yeah there you go jamari harris boy we'll talk about him more too real nice to have him healthy he was playing as good as anybody at the end of 2021 and then here this is an awesome play um oh no this is uh never mind that's a great play though by tj hall TJ Hall, I thought that ball hit the ground. It was a, that was an actual interception. Great job for TJ, who came in for Cooper against Nebraska and kind of got picked on. That might have been the catch of the day from Seth Anderson. In traffic, Nick Jackson got a hand on that ball. Uh, great touchdown there for six. Again, he's a, he might have been the, the star of the show. Brian Allen, number 90, redshirt freshman. Heard a lot of BA calls on the d defensive side for him. He was great. Uh, this might be another pick. Uh, again, took a little time for Hill to get 
settle it in, but Deshaun Lee, Deshaun Lee with two picks today, he looked great. And then here is where, yeah, we started to have some fun. Seth Anderson. <laughs> That's this got the folks fired up. And then the very next play, Deontay Vines, we'll talk about him too. Healthy, finally. We've seen a little bit of him the last couple of years, but I don't know how he caught that. Mike's got a photo gallery up at, at CBS2Iowa.com. He's got some great shots of Deontay bringing that in with his left arm. And yeah, I have no idea how he came down with that. And then, uh, boy, Deontay Craig was all over the place in the backfield. That's one of his uh, nice little tackles for loss. And then uh, this was the best run of the day from Boogie. Sean Williams off the left or the, off the right and uh, up the tunnel. Nice little run there. Good to see. Uh, Rusty Feth was in there. He was running with the twos a little bit, but that was one of those situations where he was in with the, the ones. This is after Cade went out. And then, yeah, this was a great throw, like you said, from Deacon. Settling in, finding Steven Stilianos. I know they're really excited about what he's going to do. Had a, a transitionary year, so to speak, transferring from an FCS school last year. It sounds like he's really come along well. But, boy, we, we saw some really good stuff out of that offense. The defense is one of those. You know, Cooper wasn't practicing yesterday. Um, a couple other guys were out, but mm -hmm. that offense we saw when they were on, especially those deep balls to, to Seth and Deontay, that, there was some fun stuff there. Uh, maybe a different kind of quarterback battle going on. I mean, <laughs> you know, in, years, in the past few years, it's been uh, kind of like, oh, boy, who is going to be the quarterback? But this year, I mean, there's a couple guys in there who can throw the ball around and, mm -hmm. and look good doing it. Um, Seth Anderson, uh, we've seen a lot of stuff out of him. Obviously has the NFL blood um, coming from an FCS school where he did a lot of good things over at um, – Charleston, Charleston Southern, Southern yeah. yeah. Big South offensive freshman of the year. Yep, and uh, yeah, he did great. I don't know if we want to hear from. Uh, do we want to go ahead and hear from? Yeah, yeah if you if you want to, let's let's look a little more uh, at those Seth highlights too. We might as well put together a little video of just his stuff. But again, you saw a little bit of everything from him. You saw the little that sidearm sidearm sling from Cade was super fun. Uh, seeing him get a little uh, yak on that, and Quinn Schulte gave him a nice little pop and I guess, at the end of it. I don't know if everybody knows. Seth's background, his dad is Willie Flipper Anderson, who, who played in the NFL for a number of years, primarily with the Rams and the Colts. Um, his dad, technically a Super Bowl winner. He was on kind of a practice squad with the Broncos later in his career sure. when they beat the Packers in the Super Bowl. I believe what, his what, NFL single-game season or single-game receiving record is like 336. Calvin John Johnson got real close uh, a couple years ago. But, but still stands. I still mean, incredible. From, uh, yeah, so the... the when did he, I'm gonna forget when he said that early '90s or something. something like that. So the pedigree is certainly there. Here is Kirk on what he has seen from Seth. Pleasant surprise at camp to you? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Um, I know exactly what you're saying, but you know, we didn't see him in the spring, so we yeah, we thought he was a really good prospect, and, and today's probably as good a day as he's had. He likes to show off for the crowd, apparently. Uh, but no, that was encouraging, and um, he works hard. He's got a great great attitude. The injury in the spring, which kept him off the field, and uh, but he's been out there every day this this camp, and that's been really good. So he's making progress, and you know anybody can help our football team uh, be better. I'm all for it. I'm not going to say he's Amir Smith Marset. Hmm. The six is kind of throwing me that way, but you got a dude who can catch and has speed like that. Who I don't know if he worked his way into special teams plays with with that kind of speed, but he was fun. He he was arguably the the highlight of the day at Kennick. And I don't know if in. <laughs> I mean, it feels like we're really excited about the wide receivers this year, and it feels like the first time in a few years we've had this much excitement about potential in what we see so out of the receiving last year. You didn't have, yeah, you had exactly. One scholarship yes. guy maybe out there uh, for the spring. Yeah, or, I mean, Charlie yeah. Jones transferred not long yeah. before before spring stuff, and so or was it after spring stuff that Charlie even transferred? Yeah. yeah. So um, so last year, I mean, there were so many more question marks around it, which there are a little bit this year with guys who are either transfers or coming off of injuries, but. Um, boy, I mean, there's a lot to be excited about with Seth, with Caleb, and with um, with uh, Deontay Vines, who who's been uh, uh, who could be, you know, maybe even the number one receiver. I mean, they he's, really he's like so him. Great. Nico Reggiani didn't uh, didn't practice yesterday, but mm -hmm. uh, boy, let's let's go back to those big plays again. It was kind of went back to back where it was that that big gain from Seth, and then I think it might have been the only grab that Deontay actually had yesterday. But again, I don't know how. One. I don't know how he caught that ball, <laughs> kind of cradling it with his. Almost the crowd up. reacted like it was an incomplete pass, that, and then he <laughs> he walks up with it. That was probably the highlight of that highlight was the fact that the crowd had that realization. That's always a fun moment. When yeah. The crowd, oh. <laughs> the crowd doesn't know what happened, and they're like, oh, he has that. It was, yeah. a, it was a really cool moment. So if you're, um, again, I, I posted him online. You can hear the audio on that. But yeah, here's Kirk on the, uh, the incredible journey Deontay's been on since getting to Iowa City. 
Yeah, the worst luck of any yeah, yeah sure I mean, other guys. yes and no. Uh, uh, he's had bad luck since he got here. Sorry, I know exactly what you're saying, but yeah, we didn't see him in the spring, so we last year it was a rest, you know. So right now he's he's been really practicing well. And we, we always felt like he was a good player. He just needed a chance to show it. And uh, until guys can get on the field and then stay on the field, they don't get that opportunity. So, yeah, he's, he's been practicing really well. He's got good ability. And I think we know we got Nico, too. So there's two guys you can that we know a lot about that have been here. And then the good news is we have other guys uh, now, like the guys we talked about earlier, that are, you know, now we're getting to learn about them. And it's, uh, it's encouraging. So... Yeah, we still got a long way to go till game time, but at least, you know, you see some guys in the mix, and that's good to see. Yeah, Deontay was, a, I think the first exposure for a lot of people for Deontay Vines was, who's this dude wearing zero? Mm -hmm. I think that was to start the 2021 season, I remember him coming out. like, Because that was, I believe, the first year you could actually wear zero that's right. uh, in college football. And so that was, okay, who's the dude uh, rocking the zero there? But he's, yeah, he seems like the guy that everyone's, I still can't believe he caught that. What a play! So that was, that was great. And again, uh, with Nico maybe a little banged up, it sounds like he'll be okay. But waiting for some other guys to come along. I mean, he's got a chance to to really make a statement. And boy, it sounds like he's really earned it too. Not to mention Caleb Brown too. I mean, yesterday was the first chance that we had a had a look at what he brought on the field as well. And and that was something that we. I mean, I don't know if I'd really thought about this ahead of time coming in, but Kirk alluded to it, especially on Friday in the initial media day, that um, Caleb's a guy who certainly has a the talent. They're certainly a, a great pickup, but um, still learning things a little bit. I yeah. mean, he, he's, he's a little bit late to the game in terms of – This was just um, one, I think, one big catch at least. Again, in traffic, drew yeah. the flag, but that was a great grab. You just alluded to it. Here's Kirk on Friday, maybe trying to temper expectations right. a little bit on a kid who flashes, but – still has a lot to do at the college level. I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, yes, I have seen the talent. I think all of us have seen the talent. Um, and, and it's flash. That's the other key word. I think what everybody needs to remember about him is, you know, he's only played one year of college football and really hasn't played much. I think he had one catch last year. So if you look at some of the other guys that transferred, you know, McNamara's got a resume. Eric Hall's got a resume. Uh, Caleb doesn't. He was a really good prospect out of, out of high school. I would say he's a better prospect now, but he's still a prospect if that makes sense. Um, he just got dinged up yesterday too, unfortunately, after making a really good play. So I think it's just a matter of time with him too. But I, I think to expect the same out of him as maybe McNamara all, you know, you're looking at two different categories, but I'm glad he's here. He's a great young guy and uh, has fit in really well and he's working hard. So eager to get him back. A couple of things I want to jump in on there. Number one is is that statement that he made. I'd kind of forgotten about that, that he said the thing about him getting dinged up, and then he's back at practice on Saturday. Yeah, that's good, yeah. So that's like, that's again, ideally what we're going to see out of McNamara is like, you know, one of those plays where he gets dinged up, he's back to practice on Monday, we hope. I'm sure a lot of these guys, it, if you're in the middle of October, maybe these guys are able to play through it. But again, <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's kids' day. You want to put on a great show for all the families it's out in there. in the middle of a game, yeah, he'd probably you're, come back. You're trying to conserve a little bit as you yeah. get, you know, into the second week of camp. Yeah, but but had a lot of great things to say about him. I mean, I appreciated that, yeah, he brought down the excitement. Um, you know, one thing that he also said on Friday, he kind of brought it back later for full circle saying, like, that's why we really like Seth Anderson, is it because, you know, Caleb's a little bit less tested out there, but Seth has been able to really hit the ground running. And listen, Caleb Brown, uh, even in warm-up, he makes catching the ball look effortless. For a guy who's only really in his second full year playing wide receiver, again, he was with Brian Hartline at, at Ohio State last year. It just – it's – Soft hands, even on really tough, tough catches. So saw that a little bit in drills. Saw that uh, in the in the scrimmage going up against Jamari, who again we'll we'll talk about him a little more. But he's probably he's probably your fourth wideout between uh, Deontay and Seth and Nico. He's he's probably your number four. So he'll he'll show out. I'm I'm sure there'll be there'll be a few moments where Caleb Brown will show uh, that that prospect ability and, and he'll he'll jump out. We talked a little Before bit. Before we about move on to the uh, tight ends or whatever. Yeah. I had a question about the receivers. Okay. Just a couple of them. One, who do you think the day one, game one starters are, one and two, and then who do you think that is throughout the season? Are we going two wide receivers or three wide receivers? Let's go with two just because of the amount of double tight end sets that we saw on Saturday. I think that we're going to be running a lot of that. So, yeah. Assuming health is there among all four players equally, I would guess it's Nico and Deontay. I wonder if it will be Deontay and Seth. Deontay just, and just, Seth. Just because, I, I mean, Nico's a slot guy uh -huh. and always has been. So if you're, if you're trotting out your two to split, yeah, I think Seth Seth isn't the <clears> tallest kid. <throat> I think he's like 6'2", maybe. But he's got that speed. 
and, and if you can get that on the outside, I think that's a big. We saw a few trip sets with, uh, was it Deontay, Seth, and Eric? Were split Eric out. split out. They, they split out Lachey a few times, too. Yeah, I mean, that's Iowa's offense, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what they're going to do. Um, that would be my, I would think, not to take anything away from, from Nico. Sure. I mean, Nico's got all the pedigree in the world and has played a ton of football, but that's, I mean, he's kind of an interior I'm, dude, so if you got two to split out, I'd say. I'd say sure, Deontay, that's so. true. The only reason I went that route is because, I mean, He's the guy who, number one, is one of the most experienced guys on the entire team in the locker room when it comes to guys who've been around, been around the program. Um, Nico and Deontay are the guys who have been Hawkeyes a year, a, going back boys, two years. So two three repping for Connecticut. That. <laughs> yes, they would love. And that. so, even though they're not necessarily like, I don't know, if come to the end, of, come to the end of the year, I don't know if those two guys are going to have the best stats on the team or if they're going to be the starters. You know, week ten. Um, but just like week one, it's like, I don't know, I, if, if I'm just going to default to something, I would say that Kirk trots out the two guys who have the experience yeah, in, track in the locker room. For sure. I, I don't think you can go wrong starting any combination of those three. Right. right. It's a good debate to have, considering what well, we went into the season last year with, I think, one scholarship receiver. Something like that, two. yeah. It was, uh, the, and, yeah. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was tricky. <laughs> it was a situation for sure. O-line, uh, another year of experience. Dejon Parker, uh, transfer from Saginaw Valley State, didn't practice yesterday. Rusty Feth was in there a little bit. Uh, again, was starting with the twos, and then once we got later in the practice, he was running with the ones, was part of the, the group out there that sprung boogie for that long touchdown. But uh, I know you were keeping a close eye on the O-line. What did you see out there? Uh, first off, I love that Rusty's one of those guys where it's like uh, you almost need a modified chin strap for somebody like that <laughs> just because his beard is so enormous that it's like it's just comical to see the – the chin strap kind of sitting out there just on front of the hair where that chin strap is not doing a thing for Dude him. Dude looks right like now. an offensive lineman. <laughs> yes. The bottom, yeah. Uh, him and I, I made this comment to him even on Friday that I'm like him and uh, him and uh, uh, Jennings Dunker could almost start their own like, you know, Viking squad unit just with how big redheaded facial hair. I mean, those are just two big dudes. They just have so much fun out there. I mean, um, Jennings was really clowning on uh, Logan Jones. He, he didn't. He didn't refer to him as Logan Jones once. He kept calling him Jogan Loans. Um, Logan was kind of the same. Um, and and uh, Rusty was having a good time just talking about like the camaraderie that they have. Um, but yeah, they just look so comfortable out there. I think. I mean, where we saw so much experience last year, it's it's just a completely different story out there. Where I feel like these guys are comfortable not just with each other but on the field. Um, and, and when I watch Jennings especially, he's somebody that I feel like can be very special down the road. I mean, and uh, as, as people have talked about his size, how much potential he has, he's brilliant apparently. I mean, he's a super smart really dude. Smart um, but as I watch him on the field, you know, pulling and, and just standing out there, I'm like, I can't quite place my finger on who he reminds me of yet, but I, I get a few maybe Rob, shades of Robert Gallery. I mean, he just has – it seems like the perfect package to what it takes to be a, the quintessential Iowa offensive lineman that, you know, potentially potential projections as Owen looks into the crystal ball. Um, I would say this year potential, like get some national recognition, maybe, you know, second to third team all American type of thing. First team, big 10, I would potentially see that in his future next year, you know, even, even possibly higher that he could be, you know, in the running for, for some national recognition when it comes to those, you know, Outland Trophy, those type of awards. For now, though, he is the two-time defending Solon Haybale Toss <laughs> champion at Solon Beef Days. Uh, Kirk had a really good breakdown on uh, not just Rusty Feth, a little bit of Jennings in here as well, but kind of the whole O-line situation. Again, uh, something that we're expecting growth from in 2023. So here's Kirk after Saturday's scrimmage on really the whole uh, front five there. He'll, he'll play in the interior and um... – I will not read too much into what you see there right now, um, other than like you know, I think. How do I put this? You know, Deion's got the most position flexibility, uh, inside outside. He can play inside or outside. Did that last spring roll. So you know that that's a little bit of a variable. You know, Thunker right now we're trying to keep him in one spot. He hasn't played, so just you know get him in one spot and let him play there. Uh, we're trying to do that with Connor too. Although I say one spot guard either side. And then with Rusty, I think eventually he'll play all three. Ellsbury plays all three inside positions. So that's kind of how we're doing it, you know, who can play outside and get reps and um, then the guys inside. And, you know, who's going to be lined up here in three weeks, I, I got no idea. But I think we're going to have some options, and that's, that's healthy. So instead of just, you know, whoever can show up, you know, on Saturday, get there. But I think we're going to have some options. And just let the guys compete, keep competing. They're doing a good job that way. We've talked a little bit about that, too, that, yeah, you're probably during non-con going to see 
nine, ten guys mm -hmm. rotating on that to maybe even not settle into a starting five, but maybe get it into, okay, here's our, our five to seven that we really trust. And you heard Jennings kind of getting him in one spot, have him really hammer down and learn that. Rusty uh, across the whole way. Nick DeYoung is who uh, Kirk was referencing, a guy who can play a little bit everywhere. Mason Richmond's probably not going to be a, a concern. I know he had an off-season surgery, but he's he can be back. I think he's got left tackle locked down. I think, again, Dejon Parker, didn't see him yesterday, Dejon Parker. Uh, you don't play as, as much football as he has without getting into that, that rotation and having an impact too. But um, yeah, very interested to see, uh, Not ju you said it, uh, Jennings and Rusty could, could really have some, some big impacts in a big way. And Logan Jones, uh, obviously, you know, he's fully into his second year now, at learning a position. Again, last year he was a matter of months removed from the Switching defensive positions. Yeah, I mean, that's that ain't, ain't an easy thing. That's uh, learning O-line, specifically center. That's, Coming in for Linderbaum. That's, yeah. yeah, that's not something you do in less than a year. So Yeah. The, one of the just overall themes, as much as it's uh, the most cliche football line that you know high school coaches uh, especially love to use, is just that I think so much about how this year's team just has no excuses um, to not be, especially big-time contender in the Big Ten West. Um, because, you know, last year you could point to the – the issues with the wide receiver core. You could point to the inexperience on the offensive line. There were things to look to last year and be like, yeah, there's reasons why this team might not be as competitive we, as we hope. But this year, it seems like those are not there. There's, it seems like there's all the reason in the world that this team you know, has, could be a 9-10 win team. Boy, yeah, you hope so. Again, the over-under, I believe, is 8.5 still. Of course, it's not just the offensive line that has to help you with blocking. You need a good fullback. It's Iowa football, <laughs> after all. Monty Potabom is gone. Enter Hayden large he's a tight end from Dort but he has stepped in to play fullback he would be your starter going into Utah State didn't see a ton of him he mostly ran with the twos this was a I think a play that got blown dead but you see he was going out for a pass I give me some fullback swings out of the backfield I'll take that but uh here is Hayden uh, from Friday on media day talking about Settling into that, and then Kirk Ferentz, he shared a story with NBC Sports uh, during Big Ten Media Days, and that interview just got published uh, a couple days ago. He, as a sometime in high school, switched from JV O-line to varsity fullback, <laughs> rocking number 68. So I asked him, uh, when we got some one-on-one -on -one time with him on Friday, has he talked to Rusty about the uh, what to expect in making that switch? So you hear that after you hear from Hayden, what he's uh, trying to do in his first year as a 6'5 fullback at Iowa. It is difficult, but with good coaching, with Coach Hodge, he's a fullbacks coach too. He coaches tight ends as well. He's a great coach, and with help of Eli Miller, who is going to play fullback, he's been an awesome uh, help too. It's fun hitting people, you know. You got to play if you play fullback, you got to like hitting people, and I do. And uh, it's really an honor to be a part of the legacy of fullbacks too, like Monty Potabom, a uh, legend here and uh, a great football player. So I'm just trying to live up to his legacy, kind of. No, I, I haven't talked to Hayden Large about that because. Uh, you know, fortunately, he's got a lot more ability than I ever had. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. He jumped in there and volunteered for it. And uh, it's probably the last thing I would have expected, but he's really done a good job of it. And um, he works hard. He's a smart young guy. And he's, he's a really competitive guy. So it's it's really one of those kind of, it's almost like a Christmas gift uh, came early. Speaking of gifts, Hayden Large, the fact that he's playing right now, might be a little bit of a gift. And I call them Rusty accidentally. All these tall guys are getting me confused. Hayden Large. So he is from Hudsonville, Michigan, played at Unity Christian High School. Go Crusaders. I lived up in the 616 for four years, covered a bit of Unity Christian. Uh, so he and I had a really cool connection talking about the old Fox 17 Blitz up there in, in West Michigan. That is when I told, I told uh, the guy who ran that high school football show, Jason Hutton, they call him the book because he knows everything about West Michigan football. He said, uh, he, uh, Hayden had a little message for him, had some kind words, and Jason said, that's awesome. That kid's been through a lot. I'm really excited to see what he does at Iowa. So I didn't know what he had been through because I was gone by the time he was in high school. 2018, Unity Christian, thanks in large part to Hayden Large, wins a state championship in Michigan. 2019, in August, they have a, a scrimmage uh, in August, the blue-white scrimmage. The first play, he was the running back, 6'5 running back, geez. <laughs> takes the carry, goes down with an injury, misses the entire year. This is from MLive, Steve Comiskey, who writes for the Grand Rapids Press. A freak injury is how doctors described it. Hayden pulled his hamstring so bad it tore off a piece of his pelvis. Wow. 
He says he was bedridden for 35 days, missed a month of school, had to lay on his right side the entire time, couldn't sit down. Missed his whole senior season, ends up at Dort. Wow. The fact that this kid is walking, let alone able to get down and leverage to play fullback in the Big Ten, is incredible. So you wanted a reason to root for this kid who had zero Iowa ties whatsoever and still was named Hayden. Mm-hmm. And he's now going to be <laughs> yeah. a fullback at Iowa. Yeah. Um, and Boy, that'll make him much tougher than that. And just that level of journey, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how much people that are listening or watching know about NAIA football because yeah. I grew up in central Iowa. I had almost zero idea of what NAIA was or what it meant or anything until I moved to Northwest Iowa and was doing a lot of coverage out there. But um, it's certainly, a, I mean, it, it's great football, great teams, great talented players, but it's a lot of those guys who are, you know, very good in high school but don't have the size or something. Um, you know, they're just missing one of those intangibles to make them a uh, FBS or FCS level guy. And so for Hayden Large to go out to an NAIA school over in northwest Iowa, hours away from home, and then make the transition from there to Iowa, you just don't see a lot of people make that move where they can show that level of skill at the NAIA level where they can move up to a Power 5 school. A lot of guys do the opposite and go from a school like Iowa, say, hey, I'm not playing enough. I want to go to Dort, Northwestern, Morningside, whatever, play over there. But to see that opposite move, I mean, again, speaks volumes to his tenacity and his talent that he could show enough at that level that that the guys at Iowa want him here. Yeah, strong bones from Hudsonville Ice Cream, too, a great brand up there from, uh, from Hayden's hometown. He's a feel-good story again. Uh, what a tough kid. A tough road back for Jamari Harris. You could probably argue at the end of 2021, there was nobody on that Iowa defense playing better than him. He had a pick against Kentucky in the Citrus Bowl that if the offense gets one first down, that seals the win for Iowa. Instead, Kentucky uh, comes back. Will Levis hits Wandale Robinson for a big gain. But uh, Jamari had three picks in the last three games for Iowa in 2021, was playing really well. He, that was a fantastic play off Cade early in the, in the scrimmage and then ran it all the way back, and it was cool to hear that. The crowd cheer for him, but Jamari Harris, a, a long road back, misses all of 2022 with an injury. Back in 2023, slotted in there as a starting corner. He's talking to Cooper DeGene there. Here is Jamari on his road back. Talked to him on Friday at Media Day. I got to lock in mentally, you know, noticing the smaller details in film, whether that's a, a, a foot difference. Um, just trying to help out the younger guys, help them make plays, and as Cooper alluded to, uh, just Locking in on the smaller details because it'll, at the, it'll pay off at the end of the day. As a DB, a lot of people don't think how much, a lot of people don't understand how much, and how important it is to read the entire offense. Or you can get a key from the offensive line and make, help you out in run support. Or if this receiver has his foot up, he's going here, maybe he's leaning there, quarterback looking this way. You know, just trying to get as many answers as I can to the test. Yeah, I was talking to Jamari about just, sidelines for a year that can be a lonely lonely place for a guy and so he talked quite a bit about getting really into film study and, and alluded to what what he was learning there Cooper DeGene told me Jamari was a huge help for him I mean he didn't 100% say hey if without 20 or without Jamari I don't have the 2022 I have but it was heavily alluded that Jamari and his his eye uh really made an impact I I posted this this reel of him on on Twitter yesterday and Amani Hooker out of nowhere gave it a like so you, you know uh DBU and, and the Doughboys really, really support Jamari. And again, um, just been through a lot injury-wise. Um, just came back in the spring, and Kirk, after, uh, after the scrimmage, talked a little bit about maybe Jamari was trying to do a little too much too fast uh, coming in and is maybe starting to settle back in on himself. Yeah, I mean, he missed a lot of time last year, which is just, you know, obviously harder on him than anybody else. And, um, so he's been practicing well. Uh, back in the spring, I think you remember I mentioned he he's trying to do too much last spring. You know, just got back on the field. He's going to try and make every play. And we don't need him to do it. He just needs to play his position. It's really the key to defense. But yeah, he's 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 having a really good camp. One of our senior leaders and highly respected. So yeah, just good to see him out here and good to see him healthy and practicing. The ironic thing is that I maybe I'm misremembering. I'm pretty sure because Jamari was out. Cooper DeGene was a starter. Hmm. Yeah. And now Cooper and Jamari get to start uh, across from one another, not across, but on opposite sides of the field to, to anchor a, a secondary that that loses Riley Moss, who was the other starter last year and who loses Kayvon Merriweather and Xavier Wampa has ste- stepped in for him. Quinn Schulte, the other starting uh, safety back there. But, uh, yeah, it, boy, you got to root hard for Jamari as yeah. well as he was playing and as much as 
uh, again, a, a guy who broke it down, like cornerback and DB, it's a, a pretty cerebral position. You got to know where to be to make a play like that. And you, yeah. you hope for really big things for him in 23. You have to think with the amount of experience he's bringing into this team that he could be the next model of a guy, you know, stepping into those shoes of guys like Desmond King or Josh Jackson yeah. and what they produce. I mean, that's the kind of season he could have, um, especially, I mean, with that, the level of danger that this secondary brings, I mean, is going to be extraordinary this year. I just saw this tweeted by uh, Sound Off over in Des Moines. Um, this is from PFF College. They ranked the top 10 secondaries in college football this year. Um, number one, Georgia. Number two, Michigan. Number three, Clemson. Four, Texas. They've got Iowa ranked number five as the fifth best secondary in the country this year. I think if you're losing two NFL dudes in, in Riley and Kayvon and you're mm. still a top five defensive <laughs> that's back, that's true. That's pretty darn good. I mean, yeah. listen, I, I know LSU fancy themselves DB, DBU. Uh, I mean, I was right there. Yeah. They just keep uh, cranking guys I out. Mean, they're right ahead of Penn State, Alabama. They've got number seven, you know, yeah. Florida State, Notre Dame in there. I mean, this between Jamari, uh, hey, there you go. Good good tweet finding there, yes. <laughs> Mike. It's called that's producer, internet, folks. Look at him. <laughs> back what I'm looking at. Um, yeah, so I uh, – between especially Jamari, DeGene, I mean, as much as we know about Xavier Wampa, he – I could see maybe having a year kind of like Cooper had last year where it's like sure. – Cooper was a guy that – the coaches really like last year. The diehard Iowa fans, some folks from Northwest Iowa who'd seen him in high school, they knew who Cooper DeGene was. He was a, he was a video game in high school. <laughs> he was. He was. At OABCIG. Like, he, he just was absolutely incredible. But he didn't have the respect from maybe the conference even that people knew who sure. he was. But after last year, it's like, whoa. I mean, that's, I think, what Xavier could do this year, where it's like people saw him in that – uh, the Music City Bowl where he had a pick six, and people were like, okay, there were shades of it there. And I think this is the year where it's like, okay, now we're really going to see what Xavier can do. And and when you couple that with Jamari coming back and Cooper coming back, I I just don't know how a Big Ten offense is going to throw it all against this Iowa it's defense. Gonna be, uh, it was good to see the depth flash, too. Again, you saw one of Deshaun Lee's. I believe he had two picks. T.J. Hall, again, he was, the dude who, he was the dude who went in for Cooper against Nebraska, and they picked on him right away. Uh, that was a fantastic playoff, a tip. Uh, I think the guy who tipped that ball and he, he you didn't see him in any of the highlights Kyler Fisher who's kind of the forgotten man in this new starting linebacking core with Jay Higgins and Nick Jackson coming in from Virginia Kyler Fisher's played a lot of football on the special team side and filling in uh, linebacker a bit on defense Kyler's got a chance to maybe be like there's always that third linebacker for Iowa that's the Troy Johnson's of the world the Jeremiah Hunter who kind of gets swallowed up by the, the bigger names the of the two other starters but it's like that's an all big 10 caliber uh, linebacker. So I, I think Kyler, with the amount of football he's played, and again, he was all over the place last uh, yesterday too. Shame on me for not getting more highlights in there of him, but uh, Kyler really flashed too. And yeah, it is, the defensive line, I think we're all fairly comfortable. Again, Noah Shannon, we're not 100% on what that's going to be, but again, Brian Allen flashed big. But boy, that, that back seven of the linebackers and DBs, even losing Jack Campbell and Seth Benson and, mm-hmm. and, and Riley and Kayvon, you, f- you feel pretty sturdy about what you're starting to see there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I got to appreciate about Noah Shannon, too, that he was there available at Media Day on Friday, too. And I mean, a sweatshirt on yeah. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> just covering the skin. I don't know. Avoiding the burns. But, um, I mean, I, I just had a, a lot of respect for him coming out there on, on uh, Friday, just knowing that he was going to get a lot of questions about some of the controversy going on with the gambling stuff right now. But um, we're looking at a little depth chart action right now. Yeah. Um, Aaron Graves, I, I – didn't see a ton from him, but I also, shame on me, wasn't looking a whole lot. Logan Lee was all over the place, too. Logan Lee had some uh, some real nice flashes, as, as he has the last couple of years during the scrimmage. Joe Evans is Joe Evans. Just ride him in. He'll get you six or seven sacks and, and keep doing his thing. I, he's been in, uh, such an asset to have. Back. One thing that Kate actually mentioned on Friday when we were talking to him during media day was uh, Joe Evans, I believe, is his roommate, and he's one of the guys he's closest to on the team. He was like – he was like, uh, yeah, Joe, I chat with a lot. You know, Cooper, I hang out with a lot. And I was like, those are two former high school quarterbacks. <laughs> I was like, you learn a lot from them. And he, he kind of joked about the fact that those guys, when he comes out to practice uh, most days, it's like Cooper and Joe are out there usually, like, throwing the ball around. <laughs> I sure. mean, it's like that, that quarterback uh, blood just can't, even when you're playing a different position in college, can't quite get it out of him. So I – and Joe, my first interaction with Joe was was Friday. That dude's a fun sound bite. I'm going to enjoy talking to him. Do we, I, do we have the whole – yeah, we like, I, had a, I had a bit of a chaos theory I went to media day with. You mentioned Cooper and Joe both being former high school quarterbacks, former very good high school quarterbacks. 
Uh, Quinn Schulte, a former starting quarterback, of course, for Xavier. Seb Castro in Illinois was a starting quarterback. So that's four starters on this defense that played quarterback at a pretty darn high level in high school. And so I wondered, even a few years removed, they all four guys played both ways in high school, so they were playing defense already. But even three, four, five years removed, do they still see the game as a quarterback? Again, Joe, he got, it sounded like a few offers uh, to cl- play quarterback coming out of college. Quinn said, Quinn and Seb, uh, Seb more self-deprecating, said they had always knew they'd probably play defense in, in college. Cooper obviously probably could have gone somewhere and played. Yeah, played he was, football. I mean, with his size, he could have for sure been an FCS guy. But Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Not um, but So I asked all four of those guys, do you still see the game as a quarterback? This is like a, a hundred second long answer, but it's all four of them. Some really good perspective of just how they still see the game as a quarterback, even on the defensive side of the ball. Do you still see the game as a quarterback? I mean, as a DB, yeah. You definitely have to watch because it's all the same in a sense because quarterback sees the same thing you see at the end of the day. So in that sense, yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, like, especially when I'm dropping back into coverage, um, I kind of, like, have a feel on what his reads are going to be. So I think that helps me out a lot. Um, Switching over to defensive line, it's different. Obviously, like, playing the run and pass rush, I don't see it through that lens. But when I'm in pass coverage, I do. You know, mainly just the mental side of the game and and trying to get guys in the right spot and do the right things. And then you're also trying to, you know, kind of see what the offense is doing on the other side and and trying to think like a quarterback. You know, what's the quarterback thinking? Where would he go here? I can't tell you exactly what they're thinking, but I'm trying to – I mean, if I knew that, you know, it would be a lot easier defensively. But, uh, you know, just trying to think about, you know, what's hardest for them and and the looks that's hardest for them and then uh, trying to take away what they're trying to do. Do you still see the game as a quarterback? Yeah, I think it, I think it helps a lot um, when you're watching film and, and you like see see the different reads that the quarterback's going through. Um, it, it helps a lot on the defensive side of the ball. Um, I think just to understand what what's going through the mind of the quarterback. You know, having played that position um, in the past, especially you know the way we run our defense. You know, we have a lot of eyes on the quarterback. Um, so so that definitely plays in, into that. You know, being able to to see what the quarterback is doing in the backfield while also knowing where where our man is um, and just being able to anticipate different things. Um, you know, that, that also goes back to, to playing quarterback in high school as well. I was talking to Cooper about combining that, too, with, with Phil's scheme on defense where it's very assignment-based and be in your spot. You couple that with kind of having that quarterback mentality of you knowing how progressions are going to go, things like that makes sense mathematically kind of that that you add those two things together you're going to be in a position to get a lot of turnovers which especially on Cooper's side we have certainly seen yeah see a lot more of that this year I have to imagine with uh, with the amount of talent coming back that turnovers will be a big factor in that defense this year I was also reminded uh, over Quinn Schulte's shoulder there number 54 Ontario Ontario Thompson from Dubuque senior and Iowa Western uh, transfer in on the D line he might be another guy that if Noah's out uh, for any number of stuff uh, on gambling uh, he might step in, and, and he was a heck of a force at, at Iowa Western. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Mike, you've got some, uh, speaking of gambling, <laughs> uh, a bit of an update you were telling us about. Yeah, I was just, when you mentioned the the win total earlier at 8.5, um, I just went and, and checked to see, you know, if that was still accurate. Because last time we checked, I know we did a, pre, a run-through show a week ago. Yeah, we were talking about it. DraftKings bumped them down to 8, and they're not on FanDuel anymore. So I've got to imagine that's due to, you know, Kate effect. The Kate effect and unsure about how his injury, how serious it is. You know, Kirk obviously said he wasn't too alarmed by it, but that was very initial. So we'll, we'll just have to see where that goes as the season or the um, camp progresses. Iowa State's off the board completely for obviously similar reasons on a, a grander scale. Yeah. But hopefully we know this time next week a little more about Cade's situation if we get some sort of announcement or again, you know, they've been putting out some some camp videos. They just had the mic'd up with Cade, too, and that was super fun la- last week, getting to kind of hear him interact with anybody. Yeah, some conversations with Cooper about him, kind of knowing, like, yeah, I've got I've to put up or shut up, so to speak, a little bit. And Again, before he went down, he, he and that offense looked uh, pretty good at times. Yeah, it's crazy that things even like the, that projected win total could be adjusted right now with him just, you know, going down with 
what we think might be just a minor injury in practice. So if he's back practicing this next next week, then maybe that'll change again. I don't know. But I, I honestly don't know how much we'll even hear about that if they'll make an announcement or, you know, show anything about it or if we won't find out until, you know, leading up to game day. Yeah, maybe no news will be good news, but we'll uh, we'll have that first presser coming up, what, uh, two weeks from Tuesday. That'll be game week. So it's coming up quick. And, uh, boy, the time flew on this. Episode one in the books. Again, this is going to be super, super fun to – to get this going, we'll, we'll normally, once we get into the season, we'll do a, a Sunday recap again. That'll stream live on YouTube, and you can interact with, uh, with the chat there. Thursdays, we'll do the game previews, take everything we did on Tuesday, uh, and really start getting into the nitty-gritty of, of breaking down matchups and things like that. We're not going to know a whole lot about Utah State. It'll be more what, what I was bringing in, uh, but certainly once we get into the Cyhawk and the Big Ten, we'll start looking at matchups and things like that and, and really get – Hopefully a little deeper into the into both sides. But again, thanks to Mike Howell for everything he's been doing, uh, putting all this together. I mean, these graphics are his too, and he, he did it all. You see the board. We we changed the camera around so you can see the full the full <laughs> setup of how the sausage is made there. He's uh, he's doing awesome stuff, and uh, thanks to everybody who's been subscribing and supporting already. We'll hopefully keep this rolling. This is uh, this 45 flew by pretty quick, and uh, plenty more stuff to still talk about here in the days ahead before we get to the start of the 2023 season. I think that's it for us. Any final words? I'm good. I hear the outro music playing, so <laughs> may as well wrap it up. Mike, any final words? Sorry, follow us at Eye on the Hawks on Twitter or X, however you want to call it. And then there's a link tree there, too. So you can download our podcast if you can't watch on YouTube. Wherever you get your podcast there. Thanks to everybody for tuning in to the first episode of Eye on the Hawks, the 2023 season. Just a couple weeks away. We'll keep an eye on Cade's leg and whatever else we need to. And, of course, we'll keep you updated. Episode 2 coming next Sunday. Have a great day and great week, and uh, see you at Kinnick soon.